For Crema Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimadli. Activist and entrepreneur Crispin Olver brings us his explosive book, How to Steal a City, which lays bare how the Nelson Mandela Bay Metro was bled dry by criminal syndicates and how factional politics within the ANC abetted corruption. Welcome, Crispin. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, before we get into the book, can you just give us a b brief background into yourself and how you got involved in politics and the ANC and why you got into government? Sure. Well, I'm a medical doctor um, uh, and I studied at UCT and I went and practiced in the Eastern Cape in a large township called Mdansani. Uh, and that was in the late 80s. And Mdansani was a hotbed of ANC activity. Um, and before long, I'd been recruited into the organization and was deeply involved in people's struggles around land and housing and jobs. Uh, and there was a very brutal pushback, uh, partly through the Siskai regime and there were death squads operating and a lot of the people I would see uh, in the casualty uh, shot and wounded were ANC youth that had been beaten up by the security forces. Uh, so that was, a, that was deeply politicizing. And you know, I joined the ANC because I believed in what they stood for. They stood for a non-racial South Africa. They had moder modernist policies around democracy uh, they wanted redress and I saw the only way of solving the health issues I was uh, dealing with in casualty as you know going out and fighting for people's rights and securing land and housing and you know I've remained I've remained in the ANC fold over the years I I sort of dropped out of politics for a long time um, uh, it's not really my thing. I mean, I'm not a politician per se. I'm a. Uh, if anything, I've you know I've been a public administrator and a bureaucrat, and I've worked in government, mm -hmm. and I know public administration extremely well. Um, uh, so PE was qu quite a different assignment for me. I mean, I was the ANC disestablished the the regional executive in PE. Uh, they were corrupt, they were factional, they had lost uh, in, in 2014 in the national elections. Mm. The ANC had for the first time gone below 50% of the vote in PE. That rang huge alarm bells. So Lutuli House was panicking, they disestablished the REC and they brought all these old Eastern Cape activists back in and they said go and try and fix the organization which was a great mandate um, and uh, w that's what started the whole PE adventure for me. Now you were brought in as a fixer by former finance minister Praveen Godan mm. um, to basically root out corruption in NMB. Mm -hmm. um, how bad was the corruption and what were you tasked with? So Praveen was running this program called Back to Basics and uh, he was applying it you know, b b according to his diagnosis, about a third of South African municipalities were what he called in the ICU, um, uh, you know, severely dysfunctional. And he developed, uh, I was partly involved with him in developing this Back to Basics program, which was focused on, on various pillars, fixing the finances, getting service delivery, getting uh, accountability and public engagement going in municipalities, fixing in the administration. So he wanted us to do a sort of full back to basics intervention in PE. But when I arrived there, and I was the point man, I mean he said, uh, can you lead our intervention as the department in, in the city? But it pretty soon became clear to me that the core problem in PE was that the city was completely captured by a syndicate that was using it for purposes other than delivering services. Um, and what, I mean, I, you know, I dealt with corruption before in local government. I, I, I wasn't a stranger to it. 
but it was normally around you know contracts, certain contracts, backhanders, this and that. I'd I'd never seen an entire institution captured in the way that it was. And uh, to to just give you a sense of the scale of it, I mean the syndicate on their payroll had they controlled the city manager, they controlled the chief financial officer, they had the head of corporate services, the head of IT, the head of supply chain, the head of legal services, the director in the city manager's office, um, various officials in infrastructure and engineering. And when I eventually interviewed the, the one key player in the syndicate, he boasted to me, I mean, he was, he was showing off a bit. He said, I can get anything done in the city. There's, you know, I, can move, I can move any decision I want. And officials told me about this. I mean, I, uh, you know, ordinarily there's a very slow pace to decision making in the, in the metro. Mm. But when they wanted a contract signed, I mean, that contract in one day could go from the deputy director down in infrastructure and engineering through budget and treasury, get the chief financial officer's signature, get legal services to sign off into the city manager's office and get the city manager's signature. I mean, it's like the fastest moving memo and decision making process you've ever seen. Uh, I mean, it almost makes you wonder uh, how, how much we could do if you could get that same application to actually doing proper public administration, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, so, yeah, the scale, I mean, the scale of the syndicate's operation was breathtaking. And when I, when I finally, when it finally dawned on me uh, what was going on, I, I realized we were going to get nothing done in that metro until we had cleaned all of these officials out. So. We essentially launched a, I mean, a, a cleanup. It was uh, for the corrupt officials. It was a campaign of terror. I mean, we we bullied, we chased them out, uh, we negotiated packages. I mean, our goal was just to get these people out of the administration by any means possible, so that they could stop their looting. Um, and you know, I developed a little bit of a reputation in that period, uh, which which I cultivated. I mean, part of the game is you know you need to convince the people that you're going after that you're serious, you've got the evidence, and they need to get out the way. Now, in your book, you wrote that um, you found Praveen Goran a difficult man to work with. <laughs> Why was this? <laughs> Well, let me start by saying it's a rare privilege to work under someone with integrity and who's completely fearless and will go where angels fear to tread. So uh, I don't want my comments to be, you know, <laughs> uh, misinterpreted. Um, but he's a difficult man. Um, uh, he is a detail man. So unlike most ministers, he wants to engage with th the detail of the intervention and he wants more information than you usually have. And he would engage in long detailed discussions about why we weren't doing all the pillars of the Back to Basics program and why I had this very narrow little focus. And he thought it would make the intervention unsustainable. Um, and, you know, he, he's got the Socratic questioning style. So, you know, he keeps posing really difficult questions, whereas I just wanted to get on and act. I mean, you know, I, I knew that the clock was ticking. The elections were 18 months away. The longer the crooks stayed in the administration, the more they were looting, uh, and we could get nothing done. So I wanted to move ahead with the dismissals and the firings, and. It took an enormous amount of time to sort of build the political consensus for us to then be able to act. So I found it frustrating. I mean, I found his style frustrating. Um, but in the bigger picture, you know, that's a minor irritation. 
Um, but I do describe that in the book. I hope he doesn't take offense. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us about the Stalini group yes. and their involvement with corruption in <coughs> Nelson Mandela Bay. So Stalini are a fascinating phenomenon. Um, and they've got quite an old lineage. I mean, the, the, the broad alliance that made up Stalini formed in relation to the ANC's Paul Aquani conference that brought Jacob Zuma into power. And it was a sort of Eastern Cape manifestation. And it, it was a, a fairly broad church. So it brought together left-wing groupings in the unions and the South African Communist Party together with more uh, nationalist-orientated politicians including the, the uh, very charismatic former mayor, Ngeba Faku, uh, tall man, very commanding presence. People loved him, um, except that Ngeba had been fingered in a forensic report for doing some very dodgy property deals with this ANC funder called Yusuf Jiva. Uh, some people refer to Yusuf Jiva as the Gupta of Port Elizabeth. Uh, I'm not sure that he quite earns that uh, title, um, but Jiva had made a business out of buying up inner city properties, large buildings, and then leasing them back to the municipality at very favorable rentals. So he was able to sign these long-term lease agreements and finance the buildings uh, off those leases. And it was pretty clear that he had been able to get those leases by, you know, making big contributions to the ANC and supporting a variety of local politicians in various ways. Um, so Stalini, you know, comes into power. Um, they have a fairly ambitious program. They want to scale up housing delivery. They want to transform the bureaucracy. They want a large-scale public transport system called the IPTS implemented. Uh, so they've got, you know, they've got some big picture uh, ambitious programs for the metro that are going to create jobs and grow the city. But Stalini start to then get very focused on contracts. A number of the ANC uh, regional leaders set up companies. They start getting contracts out of uh, the, these various projects, the housing stuff, the bus rapid transit mm -hmm. system. And slowly Stalini becomes more and more uh, essentially a criminal enterprise. And their, their criminal activities go up a notch when this local businessman, Farid Fakir, comes into the picture. So Farid ingratiates himself with the regional leadership. They hang out at his house. He buys them cars. He pays for their houses. There's a lot of cash moving around. Um, Farid basically becomes the banker for the Stalini faction. Um, and that's by his own admission, by the way. Um, and the way, the way to sort of understand what it becomes, I mean, it, it's almost, there's a criminal syndicate that's taken control of the ANC, uh, ostensibly as the sort of economic empowerment program, but really their interest slowly you know, and progressively turns to the contracts and the jobs and the patronage. And they start running a political machine. So they, they control, through the ANC office, they control everything that goes on in the council. They manipulate tenders and contracts. And they dispense enough patronage back into the ANC to maintain themselves in power. Um, uh, but this becomes highly corrupt, and they, they lose their programmatic focus. So all the promises around delivery and uh, transformation and empowerment fall by the wayside, because they spend all their time basically discussing how to maneuver around contracts. 
and uh, you know the people of PE eventually get sick of this. Uh, splits also start developing. So there, you know, different factions within the broader Stalini group split off. The there's a little cabal that develops around housing. So the the Communist Party uh, people and some of the unions develop a highly effective syndicate just focusing on land and property and zoning and housing contracts. Uh, and they entrench themselves in there. And a war develops between Stalini and this Communist Party-led housing syndicate. And they basically battle for control over the rents from, from housing. And Stalini sends in this one councillor, Buyusila Makavu, to go and clean up you know, clean up, uh, which really means take back control of the housing process. Uh, Makavu builds a dossier on them, and he discovers a huge fraud that's gone down in Motherwell, where they've claimed to have built all these houses, they've been paid for them, but a quarter of the houses just don't exist. So Makavu is about to blow this. He goes to the mayoral committee, he gets a mandate for action. Two days later, He's executed at a memorial service for another councillor. Uh, and it just shows you the ruthlessness of, of the housing syndicate. I mean, they were willing to stop at nothing to maintain their, their grip on power. And they were quite happy to use violence and killing strategically, uh, you know, to intimidate people, to sow fear, to stop investigations. So serious, dangerous players. Yeah. Now your book details how the city was stolen by yeah. self-serving and corrupt people. Yeah. How did this affect the ordinary citizen of Nelson Mandela Bay? Well, profoundly, because uh, all of this is coming out of public money. So national government transferred 2.2 billion rands to the city to build the, the bus rapid transit system. As we speak today, those buses have never run. They're sitting in a workshop there somewhere in PE, and most of that money was looted. Uh, so the people of PE never got the bus service that government had paid for, uh, and that was primarily meant to be linking up poorer parts of the city with the city center. So, you know, uh, PE's got this very dispersed apartheid settlement pattern. People were basically relocated out onto, uh, you know, those windswept, sandy flats. Uh, and you've got these huge townships like Motherwell and Kwanabukle and the whole northern areas where all the colored community were, were relocated from South End and North End. So, you know, it's, it's tough for people in PE. It's very expensive for them to get around, to go and look for jobs, to get to work to get to services. And by not giving them a public transport system, we're locking them in permanently into that apartheid spatial form. The same with housing. I mean, the, the housing program is meant to give shelter to poor people. Um, and what they were essentially doing is stealing houses from people because the amount that was being stolen, I mean, first of all, there weren't houses being built. Secondly, the houses that were built were substandard, so they were always cutting corners. Slabs would be thrown without enough cement, so a year later those slabs would be cracking, the walls would crack. So there was very shoddy workmanship because of the way they were looting the housing stuff. So all of this has you know, very direct, immediate impacts on people. It takes away things that are by right theirs, that government has paid for, uh, to give to people on the ground. Now, throughout your time at Nelson Mandela Bay, you were assigned a bodyguard. Yeah. Now, was the situation that dire for you that you needed to be protected? Well, initially, I didn't think so. Uh, I was, op I mean, my first few months, I was a little bit incognito. I hadn't built up uh, a reputation. So particularly the early months, I did a lot of intelligence gathering and built up profiles of all the people. And that wasn't so threatening. But you know, over time, as the action started, 
people got to know that I was the person driving a lot of this. And I really had a panicked moment one day. I, I, uh, we used to go to this sort of slightly sleazy downtown uh, chicken bar called Fernando's Chicken House. Uh, they make the best uh, roast chicken in town. And uh, the day that, this day I, I had to leave in a hurry. I had a meeting I was going to. And literally five minutes after I left, there were other security people there. And they saw this gang storm in, which was a lot of the housing syndicate people. And they searched the entire restaurant back and front, went into the toilets. They were clearly looking for someone. And uh, it was uh, no coincidence that that previous weekend at a funeral, uh, one of the housing syndicate had stood up and said, we are going to get Danny and his dogs. And by his dogs, they were referring to me and some of the people I was working with. So that put the fear of God into me. I, I knew then that uh, I couldn't mess around. And I, I, yeah, uh, having a bodyguard, I have to say, was a huge relief. Now, you worked, as you said, with Danny Jordan mm. um, while he was mayor at NMB. Mm. What was your initial impression <coughs> of him, and how did your relationship sour? Mm. So I worked very closely with Danny. Um, I'd not really got to know him before. I mean, I'd met him on occasion. Um, and he initially struck me as the right man for the job. He, he's got a sort of instinctive understanding of power and how to assert his authority. And the very first fight that he picked was to tell the ANC's provincial secretary to stop meddling in the city. And he sent out a message to the whole administration to say, you don't take instructions from anyone else. So they can come and tell you they're this ANC leader or that ANC leader or from the regional office. You don't follow that instruction. The only instruction you take is from the city manager and the city manager takes instruction from me. So he established the sort of clear line of authority, which is what the city desperately needed. Because, you know, they'd had years of ANC politicians of various forms coming in and purporting to have a mandate and saying, you've got to give a contract or a job or this or that to the following individuals. So that was precisely what was wrong with the city. So I thought we were off to a great start. Danny was, you know, he laid down the law. Uh, he had a furious temper. Uh, so people that were incompetent and didn't deliver, uh, I mean, he was ruthless with them. And I don't think many of those managers had never been spoken to like that before. I mean, they, they were gobsmacked the first time that he uh, downloaded his frustration on them. Um, and you needed that. You know, you needed someone to really shake the system up and get it out of its malaise and paralysis. Um, but our relationship started to unravel. And uh, I, I think in Danny's defense, I mean, I, was, I wasn't uh, formally appointed into any political role, um, but I was playing a very powerful role in driving the cleanup, making decisions about who's to be charged, uh, gathering intelligence. I started making deals with people to get further evidence for disciplinary cases. Um, so I do think I was probably stepping out of my mandate a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I can be quite hard assed and arrogant. I mean, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not an easy personality either. Um, but I did, you know, there were some bizarre behaviors that Danny demonstrated, which I got increasingly uneasy with. I mean, he started to build a little bit of a cabal around him. Now, I know it's difficult. You know, he felt under siege. He had the FIFA scandal hanging over him. Um, he wouldn't talk to the media. Uh, but there was this sort of crowd of northern areas businessmen that seemed 
a little bit too close to him for my liking. Uh, and I got the sense that he was, there was a kitchen cabinet sort of making decisions uh, that, you know, I certainly wasn't aware where those decisions were coming from. Um, and then when we got into the election campaign itself, you know, he, he essentially started running a completely parallel election structure to the formal ANC structures. And he, uh, you know, uh, he, he, he sort of took the antipathy to the formal ANC structures too far. He didn't integrate him himself with the ANC's election campaign. Um, he wouldn't do anything to raise funds for the election campaign, which, which I could never understand. I mean, you know, mayor's got to go out there and, I mean, if, if, if a donor's going to give you money, the one person that they do want to meet is the mayor, and the mayor can ask, and it's going to be a lot easier. So, you know, there, uh, our relationship got, uh, got very touchy, and by the end we weren't really on speaking terms. Um, but it was tough for him. I mean, he threw, you know, uh, let me give him due credit. He threw everything into the role. And as I sort of describe in the book, I think the deal that he had struck when they, when they brought him in to play this role, uh, I think the president and uh, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa had promised him that you know, they would let Danny run the city and that they would fix the politics, which of course they didn't do. Um, uh, and I think it's naive for him to have thought that he could stay out of trying to fix the politics. Now lastly, is the ANC still your political home and do you think they can fix themselves? That's a difficult uh, question. I mean, uh, let me say I, I remain uh, active um, uh, partly because, uh, you know, I think what the, the outcome of the current leadership contest is going to have profound implications for the future of the country. And if the wrong people get into power, uh, another two years of looting will make our situation almost irrecoverable, whoever wins the 2019 elections. So I, I do have, um, I do think that comrades, uh, whether you're inside or outside the ANC, uh, need to all get involved in trying to fix the situation and you must we must use whatever influence we have. Um, but I, I also think that the, the, you know, the, 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 the increasing political competition that we see, like particularly in the metros, mm -hmm. is good for democracy in this country. Um, you know, I was, I was party to the ANC raising money for this election. I saw up close the kinds of deals that get struck and the patronage system that runs inside the ANC. And I don't know how, how you can fix that. It's, you know, it might be that uh, to really fix it, you've got to go and spend 10 years on the opposition benches and let, you know, let this entire machinery that's sustained on rents and contracts let that whole thing deflate and get back to activists that really care about principled politics uh, instead of you know, the jobs and the resources and the, the benefits that come with public office. Um, so I have to say I take a sanguine view. I think political competition is good. I think to really heal, the ANC may need to lose power. Um, and people can make contributions in many ways. Uh, you know, uh, I continue to engage through, you know, the networks and the organisations that I've been involved in. Um, but I, you know, I do that. Um, I don't want to say I, I have a cynical view, but um, uh, I'm a I'm a pragmatist at the moment. Christian, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. 
That was Crispian Over discussing his book, How to Steal a City.